Now, as we saw in part one of this series, Satan was the first trustee of Earth, the original Eden, where he held the prestigious position of covering cherub, that is, the guardian of the throne of God on the holy mountain of the primeval, as yet unblemished Earth. It was this pristine Earth of which he seized temporary control in his bid to lead the angels in revolt against the Lord Almighty. Placing man on this same Earth, now rejuvenated, with a mandate similar to the one which Satan had rejected, is a clear indication that God meant man and his progeny to assume a role very similar to the one abdicated by Satan and his followers, namely faithful, obedient supervision of God's creation. Now, as we have seen, while angels and men are quite different in some important respects, most notably in the qualitatively superior longevity, knowledge and absence of corporeality possessed by the angels, we do share one critical similarity. Both species possess spirituality of a type that mirrors the image and the likeness of their creator. Both species are intelligent, sentient, morally responsible, capable of being put in a position of responsibility. But the most critical point of comparison in each case, for both man and angels, is the ability, indeed the necessity, of making a conscious choice to serve faithfully. For the angels, the tangible test was continued allegiance to God or defection to the devil. For Adam and Eve, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.16 but for both species there was a test, and the corresponding ability of spirit to choose. Beyond all argument, God could have created innumerable beings to serve him who would have been incapable of sin or rebellion. But God desires instead creatures who will choose for him of their own free will, who will love him and serve him and worship him willingly. John 4.23 to be proper replacements for Satan and his followers, mankind had to possess a spiritual makeup that was essentially the same as the angels in two important respects. One, the ability to make responsible and responsive choices with the mental and emotional assets to support this quality. And two, individuality, that is, a personality unique and independent from all others in the species. Like the angels, man is a creature capable of exercising and responding to authority within the parameters laid down by God, and like the angels, every one of us must make these essential choices for ourselves. These two essential qualities of spirit, that is, the ability to choose for God and the individual responsibility to do so, are referred to in the Genesis 1.26 and 27 description as the image and likeness of God. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, so that he may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, and over the beasts, and over the whole earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Genesis 1, and 27 it is almost universally acknowledged that the purpose of the description in our image, according to our likeness, is to mark out the similarities between man and God. Naturally, the difficulty of comparing infinite God with finite man makes any such analogy problematic. But as men and women of faith, we understand that God was well aware of this when he gave these words to Moses to pen. Image and likeness when properly understood, do in fact give us a wonderfully precise description of the ways in which this new creature would be like his maker. The first thing to understand about image and likeness is that the points of analogy between God and man are entirely spiritual. And while it is true that more than one misguided theologian over the course of the millennia has attempted to bring Adam's physical shape somehow into the picture of image and likeness, as Christians who believe in a God who made the universe and is himself entirely spiritual, we must of necessity reject such fanciful notions out of hand. Secondly, and this point is considerably more controversial, the image of God and the likeness of God, though both spiritual, are not identical. In an effort to make the best out of a bad argument, one often hears proponents of the image-only school say that image and likeness explain each other or claims to that effect. 
But such pleas bespeak a clear embarrassment about the need to essentially explain away the second phrase, in our likeness. From the standpoint of those of us who believe in the economy and purposefulness of what the Word of God has to say, in our likeness, on the face of it, ought to be providing additional information. This is especially the case when we consider that the two words image and likeness are introduced by different Hebrew prepositions with quite different meanings. In fact, the two phrases in our image and in our likeness describe two very distinct areas of spiritual similarity between God and man. Throughout the history of the church, scholars have struggled with this problem, and the roots of the solution, if not the solution itself, are to be found in the likes of Gregory of Nyssa, Origen, and the schoolman, with the distinction, generally put, being between a general principle, image, and an individual application, likeness. It has fallen to the lot of modern exegetes to move the discussion away from biblical ethics and back to biblical psychology, where it properly belongs. J. Laidlaw's insightful analysis that saw in image and likeness both species-wide self-consciousness and individual personality is very close to the mark. Laidlaw, however, took image and likeness to represent this distinction collectively, and it falls to the great credit of R. B. Theme to have first seen image as mankind's common spiritual essence, analogous to the divine essence which is common to all three members of the Trinity, and likeness as the individual personality of distinct human beings, analogous to the different persons of the three members of the Trinity. That this interpretation has hit upon the exact truth of what distinguishes the likeness and image is made all the more clear by the two Hebrew prepositions with which the two terms are introduced. Man is said to be made in the image of God, but according to the likeness of God. As many have affirmed, indeed the point is obvious to all with even a rudimentary knowledge of Hebrew. The preposition be, translated in, ought by all rights to express a much closer relationship than the preposition ce, translated according to. This contrast of usage corresponds nicely to the distinction we have affirmed. Man's spiritual nature is more closely parallel to God's image than to God's likeness. In terms of our common human essence, the essence of God provides a rather close parallel in terms of the points of commonality that are important for man to be a sufficient replacement for the fallen angels in every way. Like the angels, we have delegated authority, which authority parallels the sovereignty of God and the spiritual facets and abilities to make proper use of it, which facets parallel in a very finite way the infinite essence of God. In terms of our individual human personalities, however, the three persons of the Trinity offer a similar, though somewhat looser, parallel. Like the Trinity, mankind is composed of multiple members, each possessed of an identical spiritual essence. But unlike the Trinity, we are not so closely bound together as a species in terms of our essence so as to be one on anything like the level that is true of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, the difference in closeness of comparison to God between image and likeness is not just one of quantity, that is, very many human beings, only three members of the Trinity, but also qualitative on two separate levels. 1. The obvious disparity between a person of the Trinity and a human personality, but also 2. The qualitative difference between a spiritually unified trinity and a multiplicity of human beings who, though sharing the same type essence, do not actually share the same essence in the way that the trinity do. Besides the obvious point that man is not, nor will he ever be truly comparable to God, there is another very good reason for the disjunction between the individual essences of separate human beings. We shall all have to make our own individual choice about whether to answer God's call to follow and serve Him, and those who choose to reject Him will ultimately be separated from Him and from us, yielding a separation in human essences that could not nor will ever obtain in the case of the divine essence.